Okay, we're in First Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I do have it on the screen this week, bless the Lord. Uh, it's very small, so you should have it on your, uh, in your Bibles. But uh, we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. Yeah, all the way through, everyone together. So uh, let me turn to it here. Okay, let's read together. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing. Uh, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The very words of God. Amen. Uh, this is part one of... Uh, not a two-part series, but part one. Uh, this section of thought is carried out through uh, verse um, 11, verses, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. So uh, kind of a one-two punch. Uh, I wanted to break it up into two sections because there's a lot in this. Uh, there's a term that Bible people have, which I think is useful for us today. That is the term, a Latin term, Christus exemplar. Christus exemplar. Just, it basically means Christ as our example. Christus exemplar, Christ our example. Peter really gives us this idea that in our difficulty, in our suffering, in our persecution, in our ridicule, in our trial, our strength is not to be found in ourselves. We don't hold on with our own power. And we don't try to think, I'm good enough I'm smart enough, I have to dig deep in myself. That's not what Peter says. It is Christus exemplar, Christ our example. So when we suffer and when we experience difficulty, we look to the cross, to Jesus, our example. And in any situation, in any kind of uh, darkness or, or delay or, or depression or any kind of D word, Jesus is who we look to, to find our strength, our example, and our, our way through the difficulty. And that's what we have in this. Uh, some people say that the heart of First Peter is, is chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen uh, race, a royal priesthood that defines the church. And other people say our passage today, 4, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, Christ, uh, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude. This is the heart of First Peter. Uh, I want to get right into it. Uh, we have three easy things to remember. Uh, that Christ saves us. That Jesus, our example, is our salvation. And he saves us from three things. He saves us from, number one, sin. He saves us from the world. That's number two. And he saves us from the wrath of God. He saves us from the judgment of God. Those three things. And we find in uh, verses 1 and 2 that Jesus is our Savior from sin. Verses 3 and 4 that Jesus is our Savior from this world. And in verses 5 and 6 that Jesus is our Savior from God's judgment, God's wrath. Verses 1 and 2, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, 
arm yourself with the same attitude. Look through, look at this with the lens of Jesus saving us from sin. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. I've often, in my struggle, in my own difficulty with sin itself, God, again, I'm here and I'm struggling and I have to fight this sin. I, I run into this verse, he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Why can't I be done with sin? How is it that I have still to struggle with this? And it says that he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Does that mean that the struggle I go through has something to do with my purity and my holiness? Does that mean when I go through difficulty in my workplace, when people don't respect me like I think they should, when I have um, uh, just a bad day, does that have some kind of effect on helping me to become pure and holy, washing me white as snow? He who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Uh, before that, though, let's get to the first, uh, first phrase. Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself with the same attitude. Jesus, again, is our example. See, every time Peter talks about suffering, he says, look at Jesus. If you look in your Bible, look at chapter 2, verse 20. Okay, look at chapter 2. Peter is talking about suffering, and he and he's, looks, says, look at Jesus again. Verse, chapter 2, verse 20, uh, chapter, verse two, 20 and 21, excuse me. If they, uh, where am I? I'm in Second Peter. 2, 20, and 21. How is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? If you suffer for doing good and in, do endure it, this is commendable before God. Verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So getting uh, suffering for doing what is right, getting a beating even though you don't deserve it, how do you... Uh, get through it well. How do you suffer well? Look at Jesus Christ. He did it. Look at how he did it. The second place, he says, he points to Jesus when you suffer. Ver uh, chapter 3, verse 18. Look at chapter 3. You have to turn the page maybe or look down the page. Uh, let me start at verse 17. It is better if, God, if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. In other words, look, you're going through it again. Maybe it's wrong that you're going through it. Like I said before, there's three reasons, three major reasons why we suffer. One thing is we bring it upon ourselves. It's the, it's the uh, sowing what we re excuse me, reaping what we sow. You do wrong, you get wrong back. That's the natural consequence. That's one reason why we suffer. The second reason is because we just don't know. It's a mystery. <laughs> okay? Like Job, we won't know until the very end. And uh, it's revealed to us uh, wh why. And the third reason is, well, we do good because it's God's will, and we, we end up suffering for it. And we think it's wrong, we think it's unjust, and we're right. Look at Jesus. Look what he did. It was unjust. However, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves. The word arm is a military word. It means to put on the, the bulletproof vest. It means to put on a helmet. It means to, to take up a shield. It means to wear the sandals and a breastplate because you're going into a hostile place. For some of you, your hostile place is your home where you are not looked right upon because of your faith in Jesus. For some of you, your hostile place is your workplace. You go there every day and you hate it because people are going to come down on you because of things you do or the things you don't do. Um, so for some of you, your hostile place is just going down the street where you're bombarded with imagery, you're bombarded with messages, and, and you're bombarded with just, just people walking around that are living wrong and your heart breaks because of it. I'm going to get back into that in the next few verses. But we're suffering with that, and it's a hostile place. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like, man, if I don't arm myself, 
if I don't put on a, a bulletproof vest, I'm going to get hit somewhere. And what do we arm ourselves with? We arm ourselves with this attitude, that of Jesus Christ. Because when he was captured, he was taken into custody. When he was going through a trial that was fake and false, and it was just designed to humiliate him. When he was getting beaten again and again, and, and spat on, and punched. When he was going through his suffering, what was his attitude? We go back to Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours. Not my will, but yours. I don't want to go through this, but for the sake of the people that you love. Lord, Father, your will be done. That was his attitude. We've got to take that attitude upon him. Husbands, oh, suffer for your, your wives. Suffer for your children. Take it upon yourself. Arm yourself to suffer for your family the way Christ has suffered for his church to sacrifice yourself. Mothers, suffer for your children. I know it's a pain in the neck. I know, I know they get on your last nerve. And I know you don't want to wake up that time in the morning to do what, they, what you got to do. But arm yourself with the attitude of Jesus Christ. School, students, co workers, I know it's hard. You deal with this teacher who doesn't like you, or this teacher who just does, doesn't connect right with you. Or uh, you're dealing with, with uh, classmates or coworkers who, who, who rub you the wrong way, who every time you have a conversation, it's just friction. You don't know, you don't know why or how, it just doesn't work right. Arm yourselves with the attitude of Jesus Christ. That though you can be wronged for the wrong reason, Jesus went through it for a good purpose and that was for our salvation for our help because he has suffered in his body he was done with sin Jesus Christ helps us to be done with sin verse 2 as a result he does not live the rest of his earthly life for human evil human desires but rather for the will of God hallelujah oh oh man this is going to be good you're going to like this God created the heavens and the earth, and everything was good. God created man and woman, mankind. Everything was good. Mankind rebels against God, disobeys his command. Everything goes bad. And it goes bad for a long time. And then God so loved the world, he gave his only son that who would believe in him should not die but have everlasting life. God restores his creation. God brings it back to good through Jesus Christ. And he has saved his creation. You see, people think heaven and hell and afterlife, they think it's just some place our spirits go. We think, okay, our bodies are going to be left here on earth. The new heaven and new earth is just going to be this you know, everybody in white robes and, and you can see through them and we got halos and we have harps or, or whatever. This stupid idea that we're all just spirits that are going to go to heaven. But no, you read your Bible. It's a new heaven, a new earth, physical earth. Because God has restored everything physically. And so he's bringing it back around to something good. And if he has done that in your life, it's not for you to die and then experience good, the goodness of God. It's because you can experience the goodness of God in the land of the living here and now. And he has saved you from sin. The sin that has turned your life downward and has made it terrible and made it bad. He saved you from that. And so now you can live for the will of God and no longer for the human, evil human desires. He saves us from sin. Jesus said, anyone who has sinned is a slave to sin. And then Paul says, now that I, I believe in Jesus Christ and the cross, 
I've been crucified with Christ. Let me go back to Romans. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Verse 2, we died to sin. Okay? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Baptized into his death. Some of us here are going to be baptized soon. We've got a few people who are taking baptism classes. It's going to be awesome. And some of us want to be baptized. I can't wait. One of the things we teach in our baptism course is, look, when you get dunked into the water, it's a full immersion into the water because it is a symbol to show the world you are dead like Jesus Christ. He, not, not dead like Jesus Christ. You have died like Jesus Christ died, and you've gone into the ground. Okay? But after dying, your old pet man has died. You're going to come up out of the water just like Jesus came up out of the ground to symbolize your new life. Verse 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Jesus saves us from sin. Verse 7, Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Jesus has saved us from sin. And so if you're struggling with it, if, you're, if you think, I just don't know how I'm going to get over this, keep going to the cross every single time. Every time. Go to the cross. Jesus, your blood has covered me. Jesus, your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Your substitutionary death has taken my punishment. And now I'm dead to sin. I live this new life from this point on. When I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. Yes, we stumble. Yes, we fall. And it's, it's bad. It's ugly. It's dirty. I know. But let us call his name by night. For we have died to sin, brothers and sisters. And we live to Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 Jesus saves us from sin. Jesus saves us from the world. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. There's a nice list for us there of what sin is. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus saves us from the world. Jesus saves us from all of this. Debauchery, it's, it just means... Uh, uh, you have your, your appetites, you have your hungers, whether it's uh, food or sex. This is what mainly we're, doc, we're talking about. And it's saying you're freed from that. It's this debauch debauchery is, is just living for what you're hungry for. You open the fridge, it's full of food, but you still feel hungry. You still feel like there's nothing in there for me. It's a debauched life. It's living for your appetites. And it's not just for food and sex, it's for acceptance from others, it's for status in your company, it's for uh, security, for money, money not for things, but money just to feel like, okay, I have enough money, I'm ready for anything. That's debauchery. Because you're living for your appetite for security. You're making money, security, other people, your God, which leads to detestable idolatry. That's what, what all of this is. Living for your appetites is detestable idolatry, whether it's lust. Lust just means desires. And some of us, we have the, mo the money, we have the, the means to, to go after any lust we want. We do. We're rich. I just saw a video. Number two economy in the world, Japan. We're rich. None of us here are poor. We may come up from poor countries, but you've been given grace by God to get whatever you want now. And so are we living for lust or are we living for the desires of God? Carousing, uh, drunkenness. Uh, it's funny because uh, the word here in the Greek is very similar to the Japanese word that we have for parties or nomikai. Nomikai, you literally translate nomikai, drinking meeting, drinking party. Does that mean a Christian cannot go to a nomikai? Because many of us have nomikai, it's just part of work. 
yes, you can. You can go. Okay, it's okay. All right? Don't feel bad. All right? The point here is he's, saying, he's not saying you can't go to the nomikai. You can't go to the nomi party. The point is your purpose for going to a nomikai is a lot different from their purpose for going for a nomikai. You go to a nomikai because you love these people. You want to be their friend and you want to care for them and you want to get into their life and give them the love of God. Okay. Their reason for going into the nomikai have you ever been to a nomikai? Yeah? Okay. Here's what they do. You go in, we start with a kampai. Everybody get your drink, make sure it's all filled up. Somebody says a meaningless speech, kampai. Okay, we're getting started. There's food, but it's not really like food food. It's not like good hearty, like, you know, homemade pasta that your wife makes. It's just like, you know, finger food. That's all it is. It's just so that you can wash it all down with more drinks. And here's what happens. At a certain point, everybody gets up, uh, they get a bottle so that now they can do shinboku. You just go around and start talking to each other. And you go to the, your boss or your coworker, and the first thing you do to initiate a conversation is pour their drink. Okay? And then before you start talking, ah, arigatou go, 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 go. Let's talk. Talk for five, ten minutes. Okay, get your bottle, go to the next person. Same thing. And then here's what they do to start a conversation, if, you know, if it's awkward. Oh, habakon, habakon, nonderu, are you drinking? That's one of the first things you say. Are you drinking? Because if you're not drinking, it's not a nomikai. You're not doing what we're supposed to do. And Jesus says, you're free. You are free to get away from all of that. I can say no to a nomikai, and I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. But I can say yes to it as, as well, and I can say, uh, no, thank you. And I can just talk. Let's just talk. Okay, let's just talk. I don't have to say, oh, nomikai, I don't have to do all that. Because I've been free from all that. I've, I've been saved from all that. It's the, the grace of God. And some of them are going to think, oh, it's strange. Habakkuk, again, he's just, doing, he's just being holy. Listen, if you're a Christian, there's two things. You're going to attract people because of your love. If you're not, there's a problem because you don't care for them. But if you really love people and want to have a desire to help them and pray for them and give to them and care for them, people will be attracted, especially the, the people who don't get enough love. The people who are outside, who are ridiculed or, or picked on, they're going to love you because you love them. But then there's another group of people you're going to repel. Who, who to them, you are the stench of death. To one, you're the aroma of Christ. To others, why do you have to be so holy? Who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than us? No, we're not better, but we're not going to be worse. And if, 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 if you're not repelling people, maybe you need to think about your holiness, your life in God. But let me get away from that for real quick. They're going to think you're strange, that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation. For some of us here, some of us here, I know some of us have grown up in church, we grow up in, in families that are moral and good and wholesome. That's fine. Some of you came from lives that were not like that. Some of you came from groups of people, from groups of friends, circles, that just loved to go to nomikai after nomikai after nomikai. And now you've stopped doing that because Jesus freed you from that. He saved you from it. And they're going to treat you strange. They look at you like, what is wrong with you? Arm yourself with the attitude of Jesus Christ. I'm doing it for the right reason, for Jesus Christ. He saves us from sin. He saves us from the world. He saves us from the judgment of God. This is from the Bible. People don't like to talk about hell. They don't like to talk about Hades and, and say that you're going to hell. And Jesus himself talked about hell more than anybody else in this book. We learn more about 
hell as a real place of suffering and damnation from Jesus Christ. Here's the thing, though. This is something preachers hardly ever say. Jesus never said, you're going to hell. Oh. Okay. He said, this kind of person is going to hell. He said, the person who's useless in, in the kingdom of God, the person who doesn't care for, for God's kingdom, they're going to hell. And he leaves the listener to figure out who that is. And so I'm not here to say, you're going to hell. And I don't think we're called to do that. I don't think so. I think we're called to show people hell is real. Hell is real. Let's get into the text. As for you, you were dead in your... Oh, come in aside. They will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's, That's God. He's ready to judge the living and the dead. This is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Two words, that just one word, it's twice, that's very key. Verse 5, judge. Verse 6, judge. God judges men. We don't do that. I don't judge you. I don't. I let God judge you. And God, because I, I'm not God, okay? I didn't make you. God made you, he has every right to say what you're doing is good or what you're doing is bad. He has the right to say you're going to be with me forever or not. God will judge you. If you don't believe that, read it right there for yourself. It's in your Bible. That if you were to die today, you will stand before God. He will weigh your life on a scale. And the thing about your scale is sin is so heavy, it will take you all the way down to hell. But God, before he is ready to judge you, he is ready to save you. That's what God is giving you a chance to do every day of, of this life. For those of you who don't know Jesus and who don't have a life given wholly to Jesus, you can know him now. And he can judge not you, he will judge Jesus in your place. Jesus came to step in the place of you. What does it say in John, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18? He died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. That's us. To bring us close to God. Because if, if it weren't for Jesus, we would have the wrath of God. If you don't believe me, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 to 28. He has appeared, Jesus has appeared once for all, that at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. You die once. Before that death is your chance. Because some people, they look at uh, chapter, uh, verse 6, they look at it and they think, uh, they see, uh, where was it? The gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to men. So some people, particularly the Catholic Church, I disagree with them on this point of theology. There's a place called purgatory. You die. Jesus doesn't judge you yet. He's going to preach to you and give you a second chance. Now, here's the thing about the Bible. We believe the Bible is 100% true. It's the written word of God. It's the one perfect document in this fallen creation. We believe in verbal plenary inerrancy. It means all of the Bible. It means every word of the Bible is perfectly true. If you take one part of the Bible and blow it up, without comparing it to another part of the Bible, you are in trouble, and you'll become like a cult. I can't give you an example. I'm sorry. It lost me. But this is one of them, where you can take a scripture, and it seems to say that people are being preached to who are dead, and it gives them a chance to repent and go to heaven. That's not what it says. If you compare this verse to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, We have to be consistent with God's word. You die once. So who are these people? This is what we think it is. 
It's people who are who who were preached to before they became a Christian while they were preached to, and then they died. It's just dead Christians, Christians who have passed away. And they have passed away, but before they passed away, Christ was preached to them. They believed God. They received Jesus. They passed away. And though they were dead in regard to the body, they live in regard to the spirit. Verse 6, chapter 4, 1 Peter. But the point is this. You have now your chance to receive Jesus Christ before you die because he will judge you. But God saves you from his own wrath in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God saves us from sin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that I don't have to fight with sin. You fought it, you fought it, and you won. And I come to you every day in victory, receiving mercy and grace from sin. He saved us from this world. I don't have to go to every nomikai. I don't have to participate in debauchery, lust, and desires. I don't have to feed my appetite and make myself God. Thank you, Jesus. You saved me from this world. And I don't have to face God hopeless. I can face God confident knowing I have Jesus Christ who died for me. That's how much God loves you. And uh, this is the, the most powerful thing. I, I, it's not up here. I just need to have it. I, want, I, I just got to give it to you. Somebody needs to hear this word. Go to Isaiah. It's in the middle of your book. Isaiah. Where did I put it? Chapter, uh, chapter 53. Excuse me. Chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. This is, I'm going to close with this because I love it. Chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. This is, this is what uh, I, I was prompted to, to read this because Karen stood up here and said, uh, God loves you. And I just want, where does it say that in the Bible? God loves you. And it says it. Good thing. I found it. Okay. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4. You are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. I read that once a year throughout my Bible reading. It gets me every time. God loves you. He says it right in his book, right in the middle. God loves you. Don't doubt it. Don't ever doubt it. God loves you so much. He sent his son to die and take your sin away. Would you worship him and thank him? Would you do that now? Let's pray. That's the worship team. I'll get up. Come on up. Please close your eyes and bow your heads. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for saving us, for freeing us. I pray for those here who are trapped by sin, free them through your death. Help them, Lord. I pray for those here who are trapped by this world and its system. I pray that you set them free, Lord. I pray for those here who fear your judgment. Father, I pray that you would look upon Jesus Christ instead of them as they believe in him. Oh, God, save us through your son, Jesus Christ. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.